I'm Malia White, real life bosun and cast member on Bravo's Below Deck Med. Working in my industry can be very interesting. These are my stories. As you'll find out, my world is a total ship show. Welcome back to Total Ship Show. I'm Malia White. I'm Amanda Logan. And today we have an amazing guest, Alex Finley, joining us. Uh, Alex, where are you calling in from? Calling in from sunny Barcelona. Oh, ah. man. What's the weather like there? Is it just gorgeous this time of year? It's lovely. It's <laughs> lovely. It's lovely all year. So I love today, Barcelona. Today is sunny like most of the other days. Yeah. I'll actually be out that way uh, in a couple weeks. So I'll see you there. <laughs> yeah, what are you coming out for? Uh, for work. Uh, so I work on a yacht. Yeah. So. I'll be out there. Okay. They have a few here. <laughs> yeah, there are a few out there. Um, and so, Alex, to introduce yourself, can you just give us your background, kind of what you do, what you've done, and why you're here? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm Alex Finley. Um, I used to be in the CIA, and then I left. And since then, I've been writing, um, mostly writing novels, but... Um, I wrote about the war on terror. I wrote about uh, a drug trafficking dictator in South America. And my latest book is about Russian influence operations. But I should say they're all actually funny books. They're all satire. So they're very serious subjects, but they're all satire. And this last book, Victor in Trouble, um, features an oligarch with a yacht. And uh, so in my, in my research for, for this book, I started learning a lot about oligarchs and their yachts. And since I live in Barcelona, I learned a lot about the Russian yachts that were here because a lot of them were here before the sanctions came. Um, and uh, yeah, and so that's that's how I've now landed on your show. Wow, that is so awesome. And so um, I know that you had started on Twitter. There's this thing going around and people are tracking the oligarch yachts and trying to watch which ports they're going to and finding out if they're going to be seized or not. Um, with everything that's going on, and you started the hashtag Yacht Watch, correct? Correct, yeah. I um, So even actually before the, the war began, just because the port of Barcelona is so interesting, um, I had sort of done these Twitter tours around the port where I would take photos of some of the boats that are down there and just Google some information about them. I often included a such snarky or sarcastic comment to go along with it, but... Um, it, it was an interesting port already from the beginning. I mean, I think when I first arrived here, uh, the first time that I went down to the port, I said to my husband, wow, that is a lot of rubles down in that port. Um, so we yeah. had a lot of Russian yachts here already. And um, as I saw that this this war was going to start, I, I started paying a bit more attention to which Russian yachts were here. I mean, some of them they, they, you can't miss. Um, yeah. For example, Dilbar um, oh, yeah, was a regular fixture here. It's the largest private owned yacht in the world. Um, it it, it uh, had left here actually to go to Germany, to go to Lursen for, uh, for refit. And that was where German authorities uh, detained it. So there's actually a big hole now in the Barcelona port where it usually is. Um, but that's it. I, I had been watching these yachts. I knew a lot of the Russian yachts because I had been following the oligarchs because I was researching my book. Um, and as the war was approaching and given my background uh, as an intelligence officer, I, I was pretty clear. It was pretty clear to me that this war was going to come. And it was very clear to me that the next step was going to be sanctions on the oligarchs. So I started watching in the port, uh, which, which boats are here and what kind of movement is there. And so I, I actually started going down to the port pretty much every day just to see if there were any indications that these yachts were, were getting ready to leave. Were they being refueled? Was there water going on? Were, you know, were the crews getting on and bringing food in? Uh, anything to sort of indicate that they were going. And in fact, one of them, uh, Galactica Supernova, left just as the invasion began before there were any sanctions. Um, and then a couple others were a little bit slower to move. Uh, Roman Abramovich's yacht Solaris uh, was here. She was in the MB92 shipyard. Uh, still, you know, I mean, she's a brand new ship. I think she was delivered just last year. And um, so she was still actually undergoing sea trials. Oh, yeah. So I actually was lucky enough one day down at the port to see her going up and down the coast. And I, th I thought maybe I was actually witnessing this, <laughs> this yacht about to flee to the east. Uh, but in fact, she went back into MB92 and she stayed there. Uh, a few more days, um, and then she left, actually, just before Abramovich was sanctioned. And then one yacht, Valerie, 
did not leave in time. And so actually the Spanish authorities detained that yacht and she is uh, still just floating down there in the MB-92 shipyard. And what does that sanction? So obviously I have a different perspective as being crew and I've heard from some friends that work on some of these yachts, but what does that look like um, for Valerie, the sanction? So does that mean all crew are off? She's tied to the dock and she's... So no, so she's she's actually, she's moved places a couple of times okay. um, when I've been down there. It's not like the yacht is chained up or, or, right. or there's you know some hard security or something around it. Um, and he, here you didn't have some of the scenes that you had, for example, in Italy or, or France where you had the authorities sort of marching on board. Right. I don't think any of that actually happened here in Barcelona. And as I understand it, the crew on Valerie are, they're still on Valerie. I don't okay. think the crew has actually left. Um, and I agree, you definitely have a different perspective yeah. coming from, from the crew side because, and I think that's one part of the story that has not gotten enough coverage. I, um, I am actually working on a story about that. Um, this has affected a lot of crew. The, um, you know, my understanding is that people have been stranded in some places, they have to pay their own repatriation. There's questions about whether they'll get paid or not. Um, yeah, and there are questions, should, should I even be on this yacht to begin with? So, yeah, I know that it's been a bit of a confusing time for the crew members, too. Yeah, for sure. I think when all these sanctions and everything start happening, well, you know, I think a lot of crew, like you said, question, well, should I be working on this yacht in the first place? But, you know, for a lot of them, this is our livelihood. And, you know, they may not have another easy option. Um, but then when sanctions started happening, yeah, it was kind of like, what's cruising going to be like in the med this summer? And what is, you know, where are these boats headed to? I, I mean, it's been interesting to see, like, where Dilbar has gone, where some of them, it seemed as if some of them were trying to get out of the med. Um, yeah, well, the ones that didn't get detained did make it out of the med. Yeah. Um, the, the ones that were unfortunate enough to be in a, in a shipyard somewhere, they all got detained. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, a number of them left, and most of them have ended up in Turkey. There's a few who still have their 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 AIS is, is off turned off, and yeah. so they 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 were last you know, they last pinged somewhere in the in the Indian Ocean near the seashells or the Maldives, but that's now you know weeks weeks ago. One actually made it to Vladivostok. Uh, one was on her way to Vladivostok, but got stopped in Fiji, and that um, that procedure that judicial procedure is actually still ongoing. The U.S. government is trying to actually seize the boat and take control of the boat. And so my understanding with that yacht is that there really is a lot of confusion uh, with the crew members who were there um, and you know that they're, they're sort yeah. of escorted every time they go into town to, to get food and things like that. So there has been a lot of confusion about, about the yachts. And, and I think you're right, it will definitely affect the sailing season here in the Mediterranean because that's a lot of money and a lot of yachts that will not be coming here. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, like you were saying, like, I've heard from crew that work on certain boats, and um, they're just like, yeah, we're under sanctions, but we, we have no clue what's going on. Like, we don't know if our job's still intact, like, what pay is going to look like, you know, but a lot of our seafarers, you know, a lot of us are part of, like, a union, like Nautilus, or we go through a management company, so I'm hoping that, you know, seafarers won't be caught in the middle of it all, but... Yeah, that's it. I think that there's there's just a lot of confusion. Uh, I know I've, I've spoken with some people at Nautilus um, that yeah. they're trying to help help everybody through this. Um, one of the one of the problems is, like you said, you have these property management companies, right? The yacht management companies. Yeah. And so it, it may not actually be clear uh, who the owner of the yacht is, and it may not be the owner of the yacht that's paying the crew or paying for the services. So in some cases. Uh, though that payment may still be going through. Yeah. Um, I, I actually was just in La Ciota this past week uh, looking at a More Vero, which, is, uh, which was detained by French authorities early. Well, that was one of, I think it was the first yacht that was detained. And the shipyard there says that it's, it's still getting paid. Yeah. So if somebody's paying. That's kind of what I've heard as well, that they're still getting money from somewhere. So, and I guess my question to you, because from my side, we're, I'm kind of thinking like, well, what, what's the point of the sanctions? If, you know, you and I know that these, the owners are so well protected by like shell companies and it's hard to like actually get to the owner through the yacht. So what's the, what do you think the end goal of these sanctions will be? 
I think uh, I think there's two points to the sanctions. I think um, one is that you do want to put pressure on the oligarchs, yeah. uh, with the idea being that they actually can get in a room with Putin. Maybe not not in a room with him anymore because he's so isolated, but. Um, they do have some influence, influence still to uh, talk to in him. the inner in the inner circles with Putin. So if you can sort of make their life a little bit miserable, where you say to them, "You're not going to get these these perks right. of uh, of living in these democracies that you have played a role in destabilizing," because I think that's one of the the things that gets lost here is that the oligarchs really played an integral role in Putin's uh, destabilization activities in the West in terms of running influence operations and in terms of uh, election interference, uh, these types of things, the oligarchs uh, played a role. And, and in return, they were able to, you know, sort of loot and pillage out of Russia and move their money to the West. And then here they enjoy the democracy that, you know, their boss is basically trying to destabilize. Right. So the sanctions, I think, one send a message to them, which yeah. is you know, you're not going to be able to do this anymore. Um, but I think that there actually is also a financial incentive behind it. This is, you know, a lot of this is probably Putin's money. Um, and, uh, there is a, there is a symbol, you know, a symbolic reason to say, um, you know, you can't be doing this anymore. But also if you look at some of the legal proceedings, you can see they really don't want these yachts to be detained. So if you look at, uh, for example, Scheherazade, uh, which was in Italy, and there are questions if that's actually Putin's yacht. Or you look at Amadea, which is, um, uh, his, his, his name is Karimov, Andrei Karimov, or Sergei Karimov, excuse me, or Suleiman Karimov. I'll get it right one of these days, too many <laughs> oligarchs to keep track of. Um, but, you know, they, they're, those lawyers were claiming that there was one particular person who owned those two yachts, um, and that one person was not under sanctions. So, um, but the US government at least claims to have information to prove that that's not the case, that that guy is not actually the owner and it, it's these other people who are under sanctions. Right. So there is at least um, some effort on the part of a number of these Russians to, to distract and try to, try to push to say, no, no, the, it's this other guy who's not under sanctions and it belongs to him, which to me implies there is a desire not to have yeah, they're these, trying to keep these them. yachts sanctioned. And I mean, I think we already, you know, the, these guys aren't, like you said before, they're not going to be able to come and cruise around the Med this summer, yeah. regardless. Um, so it isn't a question of, hey, I want to be on my yacht. There's there's real financial awesome. incentive there to to keep the yachts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, another question I have. So obviously you've been doing a ton of research into the shell companies and trying to figure out who owns these yachts and where they are. Have you also, like, have you found yourself in a community of other people who are also tracking these yachts? And I mean, I've looked, I've read through all of your Twitter accounts and I saw like a map that was showing where like little um, pins of where all of the yachts are, the ones that have been seized, the ones that um, seem to still be okay with the sanctions and the ones that they're sort of looking out for. So do you, ha do you have people around the world that you're communicating with to figure out where these yachts are? Yeah, I don't think it was anything organized, um, but yeah, just through social media, um, people, people have sort of been crowdsourcing and Hey, like, um, you know, th this yacht, for example, a uh, motor yacht, a, you know, pinged yeah. in the, in the Indian ocean and, and just sort of disappeared for a number of days or weeks. Like people just didn't know where it was. And then somebody spotted it in uh, the United Arab Emirates and, and sent a photo and was like, Hey, check this out. I think motor yacht a is here. And, and if you look on marine traffic, motor yacht a was still, you know, last sighting was, was still somewhere in the Indian ocean. Yeah. That's the dodgy so, part. <laughs> Sorry? I said that's the dodgy part. They're turning off their AIS or they're like not updating. So your AIS is like a tracking, an automatic mm -hmm. tracking. Right. Device. And you got you guys know that better than I, right? I mean, the like you don't turn off your AIS you're not, except you're legally, in some very you're specific. Like, yeah, you're not really supposed to legally. So Right. Are, yeah. are there parts of the world where they are safe, like where like maybe that country is not going to ever try to seize the boat because of the sanctions in the same way that like you know, Grand Cayman, like I've been reading tons of these yachts are registered in the Cayman Islands because obviously probably for tax purposes, but are there also countries that will protect them from the sanctions? Yeah, that seems to be the case yeah. right now with Turkey. 
um, because the majority of them seem are in Turkey. I think all of Abramovich's yachts, except for two that got caught up in Antigua, but those are the support the support vessel yachts, which would be a super yacht to any normal human. Yeah, but to Abramovich, it's, it's they're tiny. <laughs> um, but like Solaris and Eclipse are are in Turkey. Yeah. Um, and a number of other, yeah, a number of other ones have ended up in Turkey. And like I said, one, one actually made it to, to Vladivostok in Russia. I wonder why Turkey is their safe haven. Cause I know a lot of yachts go to Turkey. Um, just that, that is a yacht, a uh, cruising area and it's a big one for the Russian yachts as well. But I wonder why Turkey will be their safe haven. Well, Turkey is not in the EU, so they don't have to enforce the sanctions. They are a member of NATO, which actually is quite interesting yeah. uh, from a, ge a geopolitical point of view, you know, when you look at the war, um, because Putin has said so much of this war is against NATO, and yeah. yet Erdogan, the president of Turkey, just, you know, he seems fine with that, <laughs> and he seems fine with the Russian boats um, and, and other things coming in. So uh, mm. it seems to be that that you know, Turkish authorities have given the the okay for that. There was a case with, with Solaris, with a, one of Abramovich's yachts, that when it first arrived in Turkey, it was allowed by Turkish authorities to, to go into port. Um, but then it turns out that the, the port facility itself was run by a British company. And by that point, Abramovich was under uh, UK sanctions. And so the UK government told the company uh, the ship has to go. So, so the ship actually ended up anchored it had to leave the port and uh, and go out and anchor instead and my understanding is that the port company uh, just didn't didn't get paid because they were a little bit nervous about what that payment you know might might mean in terms of their own involvement uh going against the sanctions well, that's smart oh i'm glad they kicked him out of the port <laughs> Wow, this is so, yeah, this is just wildly fascinating to me. Well, yeah, especially because, you know, if boats had anchor, especially that size of a vessel, there's only so long until they have to get, you know, provisions and fuel, food, mm -hmm. everything. Right. So. Well, and that's one of the other really interesting parts about this, right? Even, even if for now they have found sort of a safe haven in Turkey, um, I, you know, as you know, th these yachts require, especially these, I mean, the, you know, the yeah. 600 million, $700 million yachts, um, these are very high tech pieces of equipment that require daily maintenance. Yeah. And um, my understanding, at least, is that the knowledge and the infrastructure to take care of these boats is all here in Europe. And so the question is, you know, how long can a yacht a yacht like uh, you know Nord, which is the one that made it to Vladivostok in in the Russian Far East, you know that that yacht was built for cruising the Mediterranean. So how long is it going to survive uh, in the you know in the very cold waters of the uh, of the Pacific uh, Russian Pacific waters, yeah. where, where again they don't have the knowledge or the infrastructure to uh, to 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 service it and maintain it. Yeah, I mean at some point they're going to have to go back to a shipyard. And, you know, right. like you're saying, most of the shipyards are in France or, you know, around the Mediterranean mm -hmm. where we go. That's it. And, and even if you find a shipyard that says, OK, we have some knowledge to do it, they they don't have the infrastructure like you have in Barcelona or La Ciotat, for example, right? Where you have these major lifts, you know, that can lift a, a mega yeah. yacht of, you know, 120 20 meters long out of the water. Yeah. Wow. And I yeah. I wonder too also, like obviously we're kind of going into the Mediterranean season of yachting right now. So I'm curious how that will affect, like what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, what's the reason for the sanctions and putting the pressure on these oligarchs, but also like their lifestyles are, have a wrench thrown in them because of Putin right now. So it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next several months in the Mediterranean with the war and with Putin and with the lifestyles of these people. Well, yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, I, I think they will not, they'll, they'll be cruising Sochi this summer, I think, in Russia rather than the Mediterranean. Yeah. But, but I think you will have, uh, you know, sort of rolling, uh, rippling re repercussions, right, for all of the service industries here in the Mediterranean. Like you said, you know, these, these mega yachts and these big spenders uh, won't be here this summer. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of the, the Russians who don't necessarily own yachts but are wealthy enough to um, to charter yachts in the Mediterranean during the summer, they won't be doing that either. So I, I do think that there'll be a, a financial hit this summer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And especially, I mean, yeah, the yachting industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. Right. But 
yeah, I, I, as it unfolds, I'm more interested to see what happens with crew. You know, obviously being in, I don't work for a Russian family, but I, I have friends that work on these boats and I'm just, you know, worried what, what does that mean for them? Like, will they get paid? Will they get sent home? You know, like I know that for these bigger boats, a lot of the crew are on rotation, but I don't think they're able to rotate right now, which is, you know, so they're getting stuck on board. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. And I think it's a, a very confusing time for a lot of them right now. I mean, I think the good news is for, for the, for the crew members is, you know, they're, look, they're well-trained, right? I mean, yeah. they, you know, these, these are people who've worked on that now, some of the, the most luxurious yachts that are around. Um, so, you know, if they are let go, you know, they'll, they'll find work again. I think, I think there are still enough other charters and boats that are yeah. around that, uh, you know, that they can find well, yeah, that's you, true. You know, better than I do, but um, you know, experience on that kind of a yacht, you know, you, you don't get everywhere because there's just not that many of them. Yeah, maybe it's time for them to jump ship. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And Alex, I saw your Twitter post even just earlier today about the um, the one, like, secretly, the yacht that's being secretly built right now that you were saying maybe potentially has some Russian ties. So are you also tracking that sort of thing, like any of the, the development and building of these yachts and what it, what ties those might have? Yeah, that actually was a, a New York Times story. So um, I was just commenting. Oh, on it. oh okay. That's, okay. No, that's okay. Uh, I think that's Mike Forsyth is the journalist on that who who is looking at some of the new builds and trying to figure out who the who these who the owners are of these new builds um, because we have seen, for example, um, in the in the Netherlands, for example, they seized a number of yachts that were still in construction. Uh, and ah. including one, uh, Aquamarine, I think it is, whose ownership changed the day of Russia's invasion into Ukraine. And in fact, it was it was another <laughs> Abramovich yacht, <laughs> another one. He's, he has so many, they just keep popping up. Uh, but that was an Abramovich yacht, which changed ownership literally the day uh, that Putin invaded Ukraine. And it was in this shipyard. So um, there's questions then of, you know, what, what yachts were were still being built. Uh, that may belong to to some of these people. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, and that they changed ownership so quickly. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. A problem There's also um, Heeson Yachts out of the Netherlands is also actually co-owned by by one of the Russian oligarchs who's now under sanctions. So there's some questions. He's only under UK sanctions at the moment. He's not under EU sanctions, and it's based in the Netherlands. So uh, for now, the company seems fine. But there are questions if eventually he gets sanctioned by the EU, what, what then happens to, to Heeson? Uh, that's a big, that's a big. That's a big one. Yeah, I was going to say, I've worked on a Heeson. That's a big shipbuilding company. So, wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, this is amazing. Fascinating. And it, we'll see how it all plays out. I mean, I'll see you in the med soon. So I'll let yeah, you know. Yeah, you guys should go have a glass of wine in Barcelona. <laughs> Watch when you're the out yachts there. get yeah. seized. <laughs> Luckily, well, mine won't be in that. Yeah. And Alex, I'm going to be ordering your book. I, I looked it up already on Amazon and saw that it's available paperback or, and also on Kindle. So I can't wait to read it. I'm really yeah. excited. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody should read it. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a very serious subject, but I yeah. uh, but I try to find a fun and humorous way to make it sort of accessible. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Anything satirical, I love. That's still educational, but not so heavy all the time. You yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. I think that people are going to go crazy for this episode. Yeah, they are seriously because <laughs> it's just such a good. I mean, it's yeah. important for people to follow this and know what these you know impacts it could have. Yeah. And it's just, it's just so fascinating because it's just a world that most people never have any exposure to. And especially with the war going on in Ukraine, it's, it's so timely and it's just fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, that's it. I think it's a really interesting time. And for the industry too, I think it's an industry that's used to being very discreet. And yeah. I think yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of a strange time for the, for people working in the industry to have so many people asking questions about it now. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. definitely. I mean, to see these super yachts on the cover of like magazines and stuff right now, I'm like, huh, they probably don't love that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. It's good. It's yeah. good. It draws attention to it. Right. Well, yeah, um, yeah we want to make sure everybody knows they can uh, get your books on Amazon and on Kindle and check you out on Twitter with the hashtag Yacht Watch. Yacht Watch. It's, it's just fascinating. So thank you again, Alex, Thanks, for Alex. joining. 
Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Nice to Have a you. great day. Thanks, you too. Wow. What a badass.